Yo, it's finally happening. I would say that from the perspective of a manga reader that this episode is the beginning of what makes the Golden City arc such an insane season. You've already been given the rules of the village. You know its stakes. You now know how value can make the impossible seem very, very possible. And above all else, you see the true power of a white whistle and how it brings out the true nature of relics. And dude, I thought this panel was hype as shit. But the anime, like, the anime had no right to be this fucking awesome. Are you kidding me? Hello everyone, welcome to another Main Abyss Season 2 episode review. Today we'll be talking about Season 2, Episode 6, The Luring. Now this review, much like the previous, will be more centralised towards anime onlys, as the anime is following the manga pretty tightly at this rate. In fact, it was using the entirety of chapters 46 and 46.5, as well as half, if not even more than half, of chapter 47, both in its beginning and also near its end, but not quite its conclusion. That being said, there are still some changes that I'd like to address in this review, regardless of how minor they might be. I will also say, I am genuinely shocked at how much they were able to cram into this episode. We are now at a pretty solid pace, which only furthers this idea that a conclusive season is what we're getting this year. That being said, there is a lot in this episode, and this quick pace can be quite daunting for anime onlys. So hopefully this breakdown will help make it a little easier to digest. Before we get into this review, I want to quickly give a homie a quick shout out. If you're looking for a fresh perspective on the series, please check out my boy for Min Show. I think if you really want to experience the raw reactions of an anime only, then his channel is fantastic for that. He offers a unique view to the series, and overall, he's been supporting my channel for the longest time, so it's the least I could do. Give him some love. Tell him Mikkel sent ya. Also, I will say that for a few of these review videos, the manga animation quality will go down. Fun fact, this episode is actually where I first started animating the manga over three years ago. So I was still learning the basics of manga animation. I swear, I get a real knack for the craft down the line, but just stick with the reviews until then, okay? Or just go watch my manga videos in their entirety, like whatever, man. But anywho, that's enough of that. Let's jump into the manga comparisons. So there are a few dialogue cuts in this sequence straight away. When Rika was thinking about her decision on what parts to give up to Belaf in exchange for Midi, she more or less gives some more insight into what that final decision was actually going to be. She seems a bit more intent on the idea of bartering one eye and some of her innards, as she knows of Delvers in the past who have challenged the Abyss despite being completely blind or even lacking a stomach. One thing to remember about Rico regarding why she is so quickly willing to make these intense decisions, she again is a team leader and is willing to do whatever it takes to bring both her and her comrades dreams to fruition. And when first descending into the abyss knowing it's her last dive, she has no intention of living a long life. She's got nothing to lose. Another small detail that was cut is actually during the scene when Majikaja san is staring down at Veiko and sniffing her a lot. Majikaja is a lot more focused in the manga and almost seems to actually ask the question regarding who Veiko actually is. However, this exchange actually comes to an abrupt end, with Riko accidentally knocking Majikaja-san from underneath his chin in a panic regarding the situation surrounding Nanachi. It was a cute little detail that was cut. Doesn't add anything to the story, but, you know, just a cheeky little chuckle. Another small detail that was cut out was during the exchange with Poryun. He points out that he can actually tell a stone's value based on the patterns that reside on it. It seems the more complex the pattern, the more connected the life reverberating stone is to its user. Also, not that it was cut out, but he also did jizz in the manga when embellishing it. But you know what? Whatever makes him happy, man. He had a short life after all. One good nut and then he's out cold. It kind of reminds him of Salmon. What a life, honestly. Another small detail cut out in the anime was that while Juroimo mainly fights because he enjoys a good old slap and tickle, he also as one of the three sages must protect the overall value of the village. The reason he emerges not at the very beginning of the luring is because he doesn't feel as if the village's value is in any danger yet. However, once it heads to the marketplace, considered the keystone of the village's value, he steps up to the plate with his magic cum sword in hand. God, what a hero. Another small detail was that when Rika reacts to the villagers getting decimated by the giant liquid creature, Majikaja tells her to calm down as she gives up a strange scent. The only real reason why I bring this up is to reiterate how important smell is to Majikaja. His true body is made of smells, and the puppet-like body he has is merely a container for those scents to exist. Even in his new form, his true self hasn't changed, just his body has. It almost implies that while value can create life and soul, it cannot change one's being. While Majikaja-san is an exception, as this isn't an actual body, but a canister for it. Super small detail, uh, Rinko gets hit by a rock when riding Majikaja-san. Not really sure why I brought that up to be honest, but you know, the anime did cut it out. I'm just saying. When Rinko and the village defeat Ogasami, she exclaims that the idea of catching it through wind was inspired by how messenger balloons and the airships that venture into the abyss tend to get destroyed by the harsh winds of the second layer. Rinko also juices that the Ogasami is likely a very territorial creature, 
based on how it tends to take up a lot of room. Relaying that idea to previous creatures of the Abyss who are quite territorial, they conclude that the reason the Ugasami was so aggravated was because it had a run-in with the townsfolk before, that's based on the Scar, and it still believed that it preoccupied this space. Potential spoiler, but like it's so small I wouldn't even count it as a spoiler, but here is a time code anyway. Riko actually faints during Reg's decision to revisit Vapta, because the White Whistle takes up so much energy to use. And this being her first time using it, she really didn't know what to expect. I predict they'll probably follow this idea up in a later episode though, specifically after the Ganja Corp story is told. While she's passed out, Vako, who has some experience with helping out the sick, offers to take care of her while Reg goes to see Vapta. When Reg departs, Vako also mentions how it's been a long time since she's seen a boy's skin, which, I mean, I'd be willing to show her all of mine given the chance. And only then does Riko interrupt her to ask her what Vapta really is. The manga also plays out Vako's breakdown of Fapta's being, well, splicing vision of Reg and Fapta's re-encounter. But for spoiler reasons, I won't show the vision of that. And then the episode ends using a part of chapter 47 nearing its conclusion, where Vako introduces herself as a member of the Ganja, and as the previous sage. And with a mysterious egg which you don't know anything about until much later on. All I will say as to not spoil anything, is that it was a genius move on the writer's part to pair that image with this dialogue. Overall, I'm still incredibly shocked how they managed to fit two and a thirds worth of chapters in one episode. While it definitely felt like there was a lot more jam-packed in this episode compared to previous. It doesn't feel super daunting. That being said, it is still very fast-paced. I think while I personally would have loved if they let certain scenes breathe a little more, I can understand it from an episodic perspective. While I do believe this is where the story truly starts unfolding, this is one of the lesser important moments in the series, surprisingly. So it makes sense to kind of give yourself more room to adapt the more core aspects of this arc as best as you can. And god man, I really can't stress how much I actually am loving this adaptation so far. But now we're at the point where we have to go through a brief synopsis of the episode. It won't be as in-depth as the last breakdown, but I'll try to explain as much as I can and as quickly as I can. This episode begins with Riko finalizing her decision and what to trade in order to claim ownership of both Nanachi and Midi. Before posing her answer, Magikaja-san interrupts her because he's seen this cycle far too many times. Nanachi, aware of how ridiculous her decision was, doesn't want Riko to befall the same fate and asks her to leave. Magikaja, like the chatty is, pulls her away despite her protest to take some time to come up with a new plan. QOP of the year, and we reconvene outside of Bell Life's domain. During this reflection period, an intruder known as the Ugasami appears and is attacking the village. The Narahades of the village are partaking in a hunt called the Luring. Because hollow inhabitants of the village can't actually leave, they lure creatures out from the outside of the village and bring them in to hunt them for their value. The Ugasami heads towards Prushka's location inside of Porion's jeweler shop, who has been carving the stone into a true white whistle since episode 3. Prushka, now a proper white whistle, can be used by Riko to her fullest potential. Porion comes, and then he dies. One of the newly appointed three sages then suddenly appears. Ju Roimo joins the fray with his totally not a penis sword and takes on the Ugasami, only to be defeated because he cannot release the ancient power hidden within his sword. It's unclear if it's because it needs to meet certain conditions, or because if he uses it in a crowded place and harms the villagers or the value of the village at all, he'd be balanced. But anyway, Mugi arrives with her posse and they go to fuck some shit up. But this is a losing fight. Riko then notices that this being has a force field sensing organ, but is flying around this village despite there being no force field to begin with. Meaning that it's flying because it's actually lighter than air, which allows it to glide. With this info in mind, she and Magikaja-san conduct a plan to finish this beast once and for all. Riko sells her pigtails, rest in peace, and uses the value that comes with them to change Magikaja Kaja-san's appearance. Together they lure the Ugasami into a crowd of Narahade who use fire to lift the Ugasami into the air, and a team of Narahade who specialize in wire threads trap it and bring it back down to the ground, reducing its movement and overall size. It is then hunted by the Narahade, but it doesn't quite quit. As Riko and Mugi are exchanging good values, it goes on one final rampage, injuring a bunch of Narahade and kidnapping Masan. Riko beyond stress exclaims, and Prushka's voice reassures her that she is not alone. She tells Riko to call her, to which Riko blows on her white whistle for the first time. The call reaches Reg who appears in an instant, with a white colour coat to symbolise the power he has drawn from the white whistle. The whistle now unlocking his full potential as an Ovade allows him to move at an insanely quick speed. He lunges at the Ugasami, only to see that it is already fully perished. My boy Wazakun arrives a little late, but confirms the Ugasami's death. He also confirms with Riko that if they want Nanachi and Midi back, they would need a lot of value to do so, and the best way of doing so would be through a piece of Faputa, the embodiment of value. We then return to the inn, and Reg is informed of Nanachi's situation in full. Knowing that Faputa holds the royalty tag in the village, he sets off to talk with her once more. 
and hopefully gain a part of her to exchange with Belaf for Midi and Nanachi. Vaiko then introduces herself to the others as a previous member of the Ganja Corps and as the previous Sage. And then the episode ends with her beginning to tell the rest of the Ganja Corps story. Alright, so straight off the cuff, like a broken record, this adaptation's been great so far and this episode is no exception. While I do think the pacing was a little rough, I've already explained why I think they did this, and I'm more than understanding. To be honest, I really don't have any quips with this episode outside of that. It adapted a lot of the moments in the manga incredibly well, but still managed to be unique in its own way. I really want to talk about certain sections of this episode as well, but before that, I need to sing praises towards Kevin Penkin again. This episode really showcased his talents with a bunch of new tracks that just fit so well into the world of Maiden Abyss. I also love the use of bongo drums, especially during the entire luring sequence. It really gave off the feeling of a hunt going full throttle. Speaking of the luring, this was a lot harder to follow in the manga, but the anime was so easy to watch and was animated exceptionally well. I love that we didn't resort to speed lines for any of it either, and it actually just showed the village in its entirety. It really added so much to this scene with all these little micro details sprinkled throughout. It was just handled so well, man. I can't sing my praises enough. I'm also really happy with how they animated the kaiju fight. While a bit more epic in the manga, I do think the anime did an overall pretty good job at portraying the scale and destruction that comes with the luring. Ju Roimo was also really well animated against the Ugasumi. I like that despite having completely different battle styles, it all still felt very organic. For like a liquid balloon against a giant mammoth-like beast fight to feel realistic is a really hard thing to achieve, both in writing and animation. Just exceptional work, honestly. And now I need to talk about Reg's intro sequence. Oh my god, dude. I love this part in the manga so much, and I'm happy to say that the anime did it justice. While I wasn't expecting such a somber melody to accompany it, I also didn't even expect it to be in the same episode as The Luring. Like, this episode just surprised me on many levels. That being said, I really love the tonal shift it took. It makes sense considering Prushka's presence is one that has always been welcoming and calming. I love that the theme used was also the same one that played when she first admitted to wanting to go on adventure with Rico back in the film. It's a clever little throwback. It's a clever way to really portray her connection and deepness with this group. But my boy Reg, man, looking so fucking fly. God, that impact when he first lands in Rico's vicinity is ugh, magnifico. So seeing this new form of Regs, we now know that while he bears similarities to the Interference units, he is still an Obade. Whether that means that the Interference themselves are Obades or a bunch of relics, or whether that means Reg is Interference unit who was custom made with a bunch of relics, we still don't really know. But what we do know is Rico's White Whistle is the instigator for Reg's newfound power. And speaking of Rico, like, how can you not love her at this point? She's grown so much and matured so much, yet it still feels like the Rico we first went venturing with. I'm telling y'all, this arc really illustrates just how mature she's become and why she's deserving of that leader role. It's still beyond me how people can dislike her at this point, and I can't wait to see that growth actually portrayed in future episodes. The anime is doing a fantastic job of putting all these ideas on the front lines, whilst also clearly establishing the stakes that come with people's decisions. A core aspect of this arc is decisions themselves, and what decisions will lead to. I think Rico panicking after a planned semi fell through is a good example of how in the abyss, you really can't control your own fate. You can only try to fight against it. Ah, oh, fuck man, this anime is so good, I just can't. It was really nice seeing my very first animated project from three years ago fully adapted in a way that is completely different to my vision. It just goes to show how differently people can interpret this series. That being said though, y'all, the staff at Kinema Citrus have objectively the best view of the series. Like, it's no competition. I think that's honestly where I'll wrap up today's episode though. Overall, just another banger of an episode. Like, I cannot wait until next week when we start to learn the truth behind the Ganja Corp's backstory and the origins of the village. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to enter one of the best backstories in anime history. And I seriously cannot wait to see how anime onlys will react because it is incredibly well written. And one of the best things to come out of this entire series as a whole, if I'm honest. Brace yourselves, because what's to come is both charmingly beautiful and wickedly disturbing. On that ambiguous note, I bid you farewell until next week, where I'll see you all even deeper in the abyss. Hooray!